<laughs> so hello everybody good morning good afternoon good evening um thankfully we have people who register from around the world for our eloquent user group and i'm glad to have you all here today we have a very exciting agenda um let's get right into it so well first and foremost i'm kp just so you know who the heck is running the show here um for the next hour. Um, Karen Pindle is my full name. I go by KP. I've been in the marketing space for about the last 20 years. Most of it has been um, actually using Eloqua as a marketer the first four years and then the years after that as a consultant, which is where I am now still doing consulting. Um, I've loved it, hence me, you know, jumping up to host this virtual Eloqua user group meeting once the pandemic hit and February, right before it hit, I was in Boston at an Eloqua user group attending it. And then literally like a week or two later, travel halted. So we still wanted to keep the community going. So here we are a um, couple of years later and keeping the virtual Eloqua user group going. And that's the plan for next year too. But um, so Eloqua has been a big part of my career. And um, I've known Chris, who's our keynote speaker today since uh, the Eloqua days when we both worked at Eloqua and then Oracle. He is uh, still at Oracle and has moved his way up there. And um, anyway, he's going to introduce himself in a couple of minutes, but I'll keep rolling here. Um, a big part of why I work hard is to enjoy life outside of work with my, my best friend and my love, Amy, and then our, our pets. These are just three of our seven pets. We have four cats now. Uh, we rescued another one this summer. So we have a house full of fur. Um, Beyond the Eloqua user group meeting, I also host a quarterly, it used to be monthly, but quarterly map comparison webinar, map marketing automation platform comparison of Eloqua Marketo, Salesforce Marketing Cloud and HubSpot. Um, so if you're wanting to know the key differences between them, it's a great place to learn about it. It's just me giving you guys the facts, no, nothing else than the FUD that's out there. I update it monthly actually to make sure it's as current as possible. Um, in, this um, user group meeting today, if you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A or the chat. We'll keep an eye on both and do our best to answer all of your questions. If we have time at the end, I'll open it up. So if anybody has a question they want to ask live or a tip to share, we can do that. So I'm going to give quick, um, as I usually do, reminders for you all to keep you in the Eloqua note. Then I'm going to hand it over to Chris. He's going to do the long-awaited Eloqua product roadmap review that we're all here for. If there's time, we'll do a quick poll. I have a couple of questions for you guys to pull and get your opinions for planning our Eloqua user group meetings for next year and making improvements where we need to keep doing stuff um, that you like where you want us to. Um, like I said, if we have time, we'll open it up for questions and tips. And um, if you have to bug you out early, no worries. I'll send you this recording later today. We use Eloqua ourselves, so I'll send you everything. I always, it's from Eloqua. Uh, and just real quick, like I typically do every month, I'm thinking about what's this month's awareness month or what are we celebrating? Well, we're not celebrating this month. We're um, trying to help people become more aware of HIV and AIDS. Um, if you didn't know, 38 million people growing have been diagnosed with HIV and 40 plus million people have died of AIDS since the epidemic started in the 80s. Um, and this is kind of startling. The next stat, one in seven people living right now have HIV and don't know, which is why the main like number one thing I think of this awareness month for December um, is to get tested if you haven't um, and to get retested over time. So December 1st was officially World AIDS Day celebrated, not celebrated, um, honored throughout the world. And, and obviously there's certain regions where AIDS and HIV are more prominent than others, but the whole goal of it is to raise awareness around HIV and AIDS, like how you can get it, how you can prevent it. Um, it's not just sex. Like some people, I think, have their mind locked around that it's, oh, it's just unprotected sex. Well, that's one way. It's not the only way. Um, it's also to honor and commemorate those that have passed on from AIDS. And then it's also to help give awareness of where there's been wins with getting treatment for people in places where they couldn't get treatment prior and also to help with prevention services. So if you wanna learn more about it, I actually found Wikipedia to be pretty helpful. There's a slew of websites out there if you just Google it, but, um, and then what can you do personally to help honor and raise awareness? Well, one thing that's simple is to wear a red ribbon. The red ribbon still stands for HIV and AIDS awareness. 
And then you, if you are able to donate, you know, monetarily to any nonprofits that are working on HIV and AIDS uh, prevention services and treatment and awareness. One of the ones I found that I would recommend is the Global Fund. And I think one of the key things I like about it is it's global. It's not just one region, but you could prefer something more localized. Like there's, I'm sure, nonprofits, if you live, say, in L.A. or Seattle or New York City or uh, Syracuse, New York. I don't know, maybe where I'm from. Um, and then the other big thing here, why I have it in red and bold, is to get tested regularly. Um, and the last thing is, you know, social media is a great way to spread the word on things in both positive and negative ways. But in a positive way here, here's even sample text that you can grab and use in a post um, to help support World AIDS Day and just overall AIDS and HIV awareness. All right. Now to Eloqua stuff that you guys are caring about more than anything. Um, so one of the first things is, and this is very specific for people, is um, we had a lot of questions from our customers about what's this thing about IPs needing to whitelist? I got a notification from Oracle. Well, if you're on pod one, two, three, or four, this could affect you, but you also have to be using the SFTP integration tool in Eloqua. So it's very specific. Again, you're, you have an SFTP integration you're using with Eloqua and you're either on pod one, two, three, or four. And how do I know what pod I'm on? Quick, quick reminder. Let me pull up Eloqua. You can easily see when you're logged into Eloqua, after you log in, your pod number is right there in the URL. So we're on pod three. However, Sojourn does not have an SFTP live integration where you would find that is under the database data export and import, which is done with SFTP. We have nothing live here. So it's, it's a small number of customers using Eloqua. But for those that it impacts, it's important you add a new Eloqua IP address, and it depends on what pod you're on, to your SFTP server's allow list. You may not be able to do that. It's more than likely somebody on like your IT team who would own managing your SFTP server. So they would be adding that new Eloqua IP address to the allow list. Uh, formerly, we would call that the whitelist, but that's racist. So we don't use that anymore. Um, just like blacklist is block list anyway um so the action there is to do it by january 6th gonna go on now um if you want more information you can get the link i'm going to share these slides with uh, the recording later today and then a reminder if you want to get notifications like the one above about new releases coming out um, to stay in tune on those system status for eloqua when it is down rarely thankfully but when it is get notified to get jody's tip tuesday that she's sending out every Tuesday with great tips for Eloqua stuff. I'm learning new about Eloqua after so many years in the platform. So it's awesome. Um, product roadmap updates once those are published, et cetera, and other discussions. Um, when you go onto the top liners community, top liners, and look into the Eloqua insider group, if you click on notification preferences, you can uh, subscribe to new discussions by checking that off. So I um, highly recommend it so you can automatically get emailed about the important stuff that we usually talk about in this meeting. And then something, just real quick tip, um, this is a good time of year. If you use, uh, in your Eloqua asset bouldering, you if you store things by year, if you haven't already, now's a good time to create your 2023 folders and start to potentially archive stuff that might be from like 2020 or prior. If you're not using those assets, you hardly ever do. You could start to do a little bit of Eloqua housekeeping or cleaning and um, archive some older stuff and get your folders ready for 2023. So when you come in in January or your other users do, there's folders ready for them. They don't start misstoring stuff in the wrong folders. And then um, get asked the next couple of things. So I just wanna make sure everybody knows Eloqua free training is out there. For one, the Eloqua Help Center is loaded with it just in the how to's with screenshots. They have one of the best help centers that is out there for marketing automation platforms and other platforms. Um, at Sojourn, we service or help our customers with Eloqua, Marketo, Pardot, and Salesforce Marketing Cloud, and a couple other platforms. And their help centers, I can honestly say, don't have um, the level of quality as the Eloqua help center. So tap into that as you can. And then the Oracle University free, yes, free course called the Eloqua Explorer course. It's about one hour. It's very high level 101 Eloqua stuff. But if you need that to get going, um, or if your boss needs to just get a better understanding of what this Eloqua thing is and what it can do, that's a great place to start. And then of course, the Eloqua YouTube channel has a bunch of videos, mostly short. They're linked to from the Help Center, but some people just like to go right to YouTube and see all the videos and you can do that there. 
If you missed an Elk user group meeting or you want to look back at previous ones we've had, or you want to watch this one over and over and over again, because it's going to be so exciting once I hand it over to Chris, um, we, first of all, I send you the recordings, but they're always available on our website, usually a couple hours after the user group is done, we post them um, on our website, which links you to the YouTube recording. And then last but not least, um, outside of Eloqua, if you just want to keep up with other MarTech and uh, marketing strategies, ClickZ is who I would follow. It's who I personally do follow. That's something you can sign up for yourself and get. you can choose to get their daily or weekly newsletter and keep up on the marketing space in general. So with that, I'm going to stop and hand over to who you guys came here for, which is Chris, a good friend from back in the day at Eloqua. Chris, thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to hearing about the Eloqua product roadmap. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, as uh, KP mentioned, I'm Chris Campbell. Uh, I'm a director of product management here with uh, Oracle focused on the Eloqua product. Um, and uh, I actually joined, um, I think about, I joined Eloqua about a month or two after Karen did. Um, we, uh, back in the day, we had uh, a boot camp. Eloqua had a boot camp where all new employees went to in Toronto. Um, and we were actually in uh, the same boot camp week uh, together. Uh, so that's when we got to meet each other uh, right at our, uh, I'll say, at least at my birth birth point uh, with Eloqua. Um, all right. And with that, um, let's pop into the, uh, our roadmap presentation. <clears throat> and uh, I will apologize for a little, probably a little bit of sniffling and maybe a little bit of coughing that you'll hear from me. Uh, I had the flu pretty rough over uh, late last week and the weekend, um, and I'm, I'm still dealing with some residual effects from that, uh, but I'll, I'll try to keep that to a minimum um, and uh, probably go on mute if I need to cough or anything. Uh, we will be looking at some future facing items, so we'll show our, face, our, our safe harbor. We do have best intentions on any timelines that are provided and the features functionalities that are discussed to deliver those. Uh, but of course, due to changing business <clears throat> conditions and, and things like things of that nature, sometimes we miss targets or have to uh, change, uh, change course without uh, any notice or, or very little notice as well. All right. And uh, what I'd like to take you through today, first off, is our vision. Uh, we'll talk about upcoming innovations, so things that are on the horizon that we're currently working on. We'll try to get, I'll try to give some time frames on some of these things. Uh, some are a little bit closer than others. I'll try to highlight that as well. And then uh, towards the end, we'll talk about recent highlights as well. So things that have been released recently and overall uh, amongst uh, the upcoming innovations and the recent highlights, we'll, we're, this isn't necessarily a very, a, an incredibly comprehensive list. It's, it's the high level kind of uh, bigger items, right? That we, uh, that we wanna make sure are advertised and so forth. Uh, we tend to include um, a lot more detail within our customer release briefings as well, um, and th that will continue uh, as we go through in the in the future as well with the next one. Um, that I think we're doing in uh, probably January uh, timeframe for 23A. All right, uh, and if any questions along the way, by all by all means, please feel free to ask. I think there's a Q&A section. I'm not sure everybody can speak up or not. That's which is fine, but uh, but please ask in the Q&A, and uh, we'll try to address those as we um, as we go along and, and towards the end as well. All right. So um, as, as, we're talking, uh, as we talk to our customers about their changing environments and their focus for their marketing strategies, we've noticed three uh, main categories. And we'll see these pop up here as we build the slide out. Uh, first off is there's an evolution to uh, marketing being involved in cross CX instead of just marketing applications and, and marketing experience um, that's been happening. Uh, marketing's charter is evolving to involve uh, to include all touch points um, across the customer experience uh, from beginning all the way through to deal closure and, and loyalty onboarding and so forth as well. Um, so marketing is, is being responsible and, and being chartered with being responsible for qu quite a bit more of that experience um, from um, audience collection all the way through customer onboarding <clears throat> and loyalty. Um, marketers definitely want to better understand their customers, right? Um, in addition to how they're interacting with the brand, right? This helps them to build better content, know when to market to people, when to target people, um, what to do, when to back off as well. Um, businesses in general are reevaluating their marketing landscape. Uh, they have a renewed interest in connecting their processes and their technologies, their programs, of course, as you, as you might imagine. <clears throat> and then lastly, organizations want to connect their data in a centralized place, right? Um, 
This helps them gain a comprehensive view of their customers. Uh, we'll talk about a unified profile, but it, it helps build that unified profile up again so they can do better targeting, better segmentation, uh, and so forth as well. Uh, the second area, uh, second main thing that we've noticed is that marketers, they need to do more with less, right? There's less time, there's less resources, uh, there's less money to spend on applications and and um, and products and so forth to do things for you. So they they need to do they need their applications to do more. They need to be more efficient, um, and in general, just do more with less um, less effort, less time, less resources, <clears throat> um, et cetera. And lastly, um, customer behavior is changing, right? So you might say, well, you know, customer behavior is always changing, and that's absolutely true. Um, there's um, there's still an, an exception where um, there's a, a, a need to create a highly personalized and relevant experience today. And as customer uh, behavior is changing and evolving, um, the products and the, the marketing plans and so forth um, and the content need to change and adapt to that as well. And so the products need to be updated to, to help facilitate this at the same time. Um, <clears throat> channel preferences are changing as well. Customers are connecting with the brands. Um, more consistently through their mobile devices. Uh, as you might imagine, you know, we've been talking about this for years, but it's, it's definitely happening more and more. I can tell you for the last, last few years, I've been working from home here exclusively, and uh, I've actually only had one trip in the last three years, and, um, and it was just, a, it was just a, a one night trip, believe it or not, very brief. Um, and I've, even though I'm sitting here in front of a, a, a computer desk all day, uh, with two monitors in front of me, I still have my cell phone right next to me at my left hand, uh, literally the entire time, the entire day. And I'm checking things there as well. If I go to the kitchen to get some food, I take my phone with me and I'm looking at my food, uh, looking at my phone while my food's in the microwave or on the stove uh, warming up. All right. So mobile is definitely uh, very prevalent and becoming more prevalent as well. Uh, that trend is still happening. All right, so with these things in mind, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and build this slide out uh, completely so we can see everything. Um, so what do marketers uh, and CX leaders actually need? Um, <clears throat> to deliver on a real-time connected experience, they need these three main categories of items, right? So they need to be able to personalize at scale, they need to be able to, uh, to create connected experiences, and they need to be able to differentiate their marketing uh, and their marketing plans and, and content and so forth as well. So to personalize at scale, uh, to accomplish that, you need a unified profile for your customers, right? This is not just marketing data, it's data that the business has on those individuals, on, those, on, those, on your customers and your prospects as much as possible in a single place. Uh, so you can then create segments and make decisions and so forth on when to, what to send and when to send it um, as well. Um, this also helps with enrichment. Uh, so to learn and gather as much insight about those customers and those prospects as well at the same time. <laughs> and of course, managing uh, that content that you're going to be sending in a centralized um, location for enablement and uh, uh, you know, approvals and, and sign-offs and things like that before things go out and, and reuse uh, by all means as well. Um, for connected experiences, you need to be able to digitally orchestrate. So create intelligent journeys for your customers, as well as your employees, right, internally. So there's a lot of, a lot of our customers are actually using Eloqua internally uh, for internal communication purposes. Oracle does this itself as well. Uh, many customers that I'm talking to are, are doing something similar, especially larger uh, businesses. You need to be able to activate uh, content in real time and activate um, audiences in real time across channels, right? So this means email, it means advertising, commerce, uh, out to events, loyalty programs, customer onboarding, um, you name it. And then, of course, they need to differentiate their marketing. <clears throat> and to do that, um, <clears throat> this is where we can work smarter instead of harder, where uh, features, you know, the AI features that uh, Oracle's offered for Eloqua, for responses, for other products as well, uh, that are machine learning based, we can take this data set that we have, we can get insights from that in an automated fashion. We can mine that data, feed that back into the system, and of course, again, make automated decisions. So, for instance, like S, uh, uh, STO, right, is a great example. We're we're finding the best, the best possible optimized time to send the communication so so it will get opened and it will get engaged with. Um, that is completely automated within the platform, as an example. Right? There's other features like this as well that are that are existing. And then lastly, the platform needs to scale and grow. As your, um, as your business is growing, as your marketing uh, um, plans and, and um, practices are, are being engaged with more, 
uh, you're getting more prospects in <clears throat> those uh, those applications that are powering all of that and the content, everything around it, the automation needs to scale and grow uh, as as um, success happens as well. Uh, and so that's another aspect, obviously, of this that, that plays a big role. <clears throat> all right, now taking these three um, themes, we've got uh, some, some areas that we've been investing in that are highlighted here. Uh, we'll talk about some of these as we go through. <laughs> excuse me, uh, the next few slides in the, into the recent innovations and the, the upcoming um, 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 innovations as well section. So, um, you know, if, as far as connected experiences, we've been building out um, engineered experiences uh, very specifically within um, our fusion marketing add-on for Eloqua, right? Uh, this is a, in essence been positioned and, and shown as a, a net new product. Um, in actuality, Eloqua is powering um, a, lo a lot of the functionality that's behind the scenes. Um, it's not just Eloqua, though. It's actually this uh, fusion marketing application and product are actually tying together um, Eloqua uh, advertising from Oracle as well in the, in the um, form of um, um, ad campaign manager. Um, it's also tying in um, content management via OCM. And then CRM integration and, and interaction with sales <clears throat> via CX sales, which will also expand into Salesforce as well um, as we get it as we get to up more updates within the Salesforce integration. And so it's it's really tying together a lot of the processes uh, and a lot of the manual steps that a marketer would typically do to launch a cross-channel campaign with managed content, highly personalized to individual audience members at an account, for instance, and then managing uh, lead creation. Um, across, um, you know, as engagement comes in, uh, a crossover to sales, <clears throat> so they can have an, a, and not just necessarily a lead created, but um, maybe, a, maybe I'll use the word intelligent lead or opportunity even, where we can create an opportunity, we can create a lead, and we can associate the contacts from the account that are also engaged to that particular lead or opportunity um, on the fly as we're going based on the information that, that Eloqua is collecting. Uh, we've got unified platform services behind the scenes as well. So unifying uh, the different places where the data <clears throat> is stored and having that communication path, this will expand in the future quite a bit as well. So Oracle has, uh, you'll see on the next slide, there's a mention of uh, Fusion. Uh, we are moving towards <clears throat> um, having marketing on top of Fusion as well and accessing the same data set that all of the um, you know, enterprise level, you know, HCM, uh, ERP, Sales Cloud as well as built on Fusion. Marketing uh, eventually will be built on Fusion as well. And so we'll have, a, in essence, a common data set that um, all of these different applications can access and, and function on and, and work with. Uh, and that will be, uh, that will open up a, a whole new worlds, right, of, of uh, being able to um, uh, have a connected experience, consistent experience um, across the board as well. Uh, as far as differentiating marketing, having a Redwood, uh, the Redwood guided UX is a major factor there in the sense that when you log into an Oracle Cloud application, a CX application, you will see a very familiar um, UI and menu patterns and layout of the application. So if you switch from marketing to sales to content and so forth um, and to your CDP, as an, another example, you will see um, a very familiar, in essence, the same type of UI. Uh, the same type of layout, the same type of, of UX patterns uh, within that application. So there's familiarity from switching from one function to another um, that allows and facilitates adoption and, and um, uh, getting more value quicker out of those applications. Familiarity, right? Uh, and in personalizing at scale, <clears throat> um, creating cross-channel and predictive real-time experiences, you know, introducing some features around this, um, around these areas, just, again, to help get more out of the products um, in a, a quicker time frame and in a, in a sustained time frame, right, as we move forward. All right, and this is a little bit more of, of a what I consider more of a tech stacky type of slide. Um, all of the all of the products that we're talking about um, and have talked about as part of the suite um, are on Oracle Gen 2 cloud infrastructure. Um, it includes a lot of layers around the autonomous database, the AI and the ML features as well, analytics and, and so forth. All of these things um, you know, are built on top of our um, our, our Gen 2 cloud infrastructure, <clears throat> or uh, Eloq was actually uh, I believe about halfway moved over will be the, the rest of the, the rest of the halfway moved over. Um, or I think in the first half of next year. Um, and at the center of the universe, ultimately, will be uh, the Unity CDP. And uh, so sales will be 
uh, pushing data there, also being able to pull data, service the same way, advertising obviously connected in, and of course marketing. Uh, what we're planning to do longer term with, uh, with marketing is actually have um, and use Unity as the data store. As the, as the primary data store for marketing. Uh, so when you're going in to do things like create a segment, you are segmenting in essence on Unity. You're not segmenting on the Eloqua data set. When you're sending emails, obviously those contacts would be coming from Unity. They wouldn't necessarily be coming from, um, <clears throat> from the Eloqua database that is separate, right? It is. It would in essence be a, a single database at that stage. Um, not to cause any fear or anything, um, it doesn't mean that, that uh, marketing will require Unity. In essence, what this is saying is for, for instance, a smaller customer that doesn't have a CDP or doesn't want a CDP at the time, um, Unity would still be powering things behind the scenes. It would just be done in a very uh, a simpler way with maybe uh, less less of the, uh, the raw Unity um, feature set exposed with an option to expand into a full CDP in the future in a very easy uh, in a very easy manner from a, a technical point of view as, as well as a just flipping on the flipping the products on um, point of view as well. All right. <clears throat> so with that, um, I'll jump into the upcoming innovations. Um, the, so the next, I think, about eight or nine slides just uh, detail out uh, some things that we've been working on um, that are coming soon. Uh, and once we get through this section, we'll we'll get into some things that we have released recently as well that you, you may or uh, maybe probably noticed, but maybe maybe if you didn't, uh, be good to highlight those as well. Um, so first and foremost, we are working on um, yet another new new user experience. <clears throat> um, this is a full Redwood design of the application. Uh, we are looking at um, changing the uh, UI framework, the UX framework that's behind the scenes uh, that has been there in uh, Eloqua since about 2010 when we introduced E10. Uh, so this is this, <clears throat> excuse me, this will be a, a a bigger update to the UI than you've seen in the past, uh, where we have made some changes. Excuse me, we're also looking at. Um, updating and we'll be changing and updating some of the older E9 screens as well. So um, when you look at things like user management and CDOs and things of that nature, um, there's been a lot of feedback that we've gotten over the years that, hey, these are really older screens, they're harder to use, and we don't disagree. Uh, we are definitely taking a look at those as well to get those updated and get the entire product uh, to a consistent state UI-wise um, as much as we possibly can, you know, obviously where it makes sense. Uh, some places it doesn't make sense because they're just not used that often, um, if at all anymore. Um, so we're really excited about this. You'll start to see, I think, some more uh, information around this show up um, probably in the first half of 2023. And um, it, we will we are planning to roll this out in such a way there that there would be an optional uh, kind of preview mode. So uh, you wouldn't wake up on a, say, a Monday morning after the release weekend, it, log into Eloqua and see something brand new that you've never seen before UI-wise and say, hey, how do I use Eloqua now? Uh, we want to be sure that, uh, you know, that we're sensitive to the fact that there's a, there's learning and there's some adoption to any new UI that, that we roll out um, and customers have an, have an opportunity to, to in essence, uh, adopt that, you know, learn it as well at the same time. Um, as far as um, uh, fusion marketing, we talked about that on a, a couple slides ago in the vision. <clears throat> um, this is a, a new guided campaign workflow uh, product that's been released. We've been talking about it for quite a while, for about a year now, I think. Uh, we have a, a few customers that are using this um, at this stage as well, launching campaigns. We've been using it for, I think, about 18 months or so um, internally at Oracle as well in launching campaigns. And in essence, it allows you allows a user to build up um, content. I'm sorry, I should say build up a um, build up a a campaign that is cross-channel, including emails um, <clears throat> that link to landing pages that are highly personalized with customer stories that actually are sourced from um, OCM, Oracle Content Management. Um, advertising to go along with this, so you can select imagery and so forth for the advertise uh, for the advertisements you want to place, the places you want to put those advertisements. The audience that you select for the campaign, um, the, the accounts that those contacts are associated, they would be targeted as part of the advertising as well. And you can even go so far today, at least, as to pick budgeting information around how much you want to spend for the advertising. Um, <clears throat> and then there's, of course, reporting that comes back as well. So there's, there's some new functionality. We do keep investing in this. There's functionality included in 
uh, the CRM integrations specifically for sales cloud that we're attacking first um, to help control uh, very specific details around lead creation and identifying leads um, and getting the contacts that are um, for a particular, say for a particular individual that's in the campaign. Um, we want to create a lead for that individual <clears throat> because they have engaged with the, with the content in the campaign. Um, that contact belongs to an account. That, that's, that's actually a requirement for uh, launching one of these campaigns. This, is, this does have an account-based component to it. Um, and there might be other contacts within the within this campaign, the same campaign that belong to that same account. We can take those um, we can take those contacts that are related as well that are part of this campaign and also link them to this lead or opportunity that we create. Um, and we're built so we're building that type of functionality within to the CRM integrations to facilitate this. Um, and this is our uh, in essence a, a kind of a first entry, first foray into um, identifying and, and building out buying groups, right? If we're building an opportunity based on this engagement, we're taking the group of contacts that have been identified by the marketer to enter the campaign for that account. We can attach them. That's your buying group that sales can now focus on. As we move forward into the future, uh, we also want to um, not just have the marketer identify the buying group, but as you can imagine, um, if you have organic interactions happening on your website and your form submits and so forth, and that's putting people into campaigns that's generating other engagements and activities for other people from this from maybe a same account to uh, participate in, we'd love to be able to get to a place where we can identify that buying group organically as well uh, without the marketer having to do much. And then we can present that to the marketer within the application in a way that can be actionable um, as well. Uh, so a lot of exciting things around this coming in the future. Um, a lot of ideas that we have as well on how we can build this out. <clears throat> um, a seemingly smaller features uh, that are coming soon. Uh, this is helping close some gaps that we've had between simple campaigns as well as, uh, and uh, I'll say multi-step campaigns. Um, so the first and foremost one, um, we introduced approvals on multi-step campaigns uh, quite a while, quite a long time ago. I think this is probably close to 10 years ago now. And when we did that, we never actually put the campaign approvals onto simple campaigns as well. And we've gotten feedback over the years, uh, especially from some of the larger enterprise customers that are that need this type of approvals, uh, need these type of approvals enabled in their instances, <clears throat> um, that this is a gap. Uh, in essence, they treat it as a little bit of a security hole. And uh, so we are planning to add simple, uh, adding, sorry, added uh, campaign approvals to simple campaigns in the future, um, close that gap out. A couple of other items, um, we would, um, there's a, uh, there's some um, sending options that are on a, a email step on a multi-step campaign, such as sending to unsubscribed um, um, contacts. Um, there's, a, there's a couple other options in here as well. Um, I don't remember all of them. They're not here on the slide, but uh, they're not they're not present on the simple campaign sending options, which would be under uh, under if you expand out the advanced options down here at the bottom, you would see those in your eloquent instance. Uh, we're planning to shore all of this up, all of this functionality up. So when you operate a simple campaign, you can in essence get the same capabilities that you have in a multi-step email uh, send as well. <laughs> so a little bit smaller item, but um, again makes a makes a pretty big difference, a pretty important difference for. Um, for quite a few customers that we've heard from. Um, uh, this is another uh, bigger area. We've been working on this for the past few releases. Um, there's a little bit of information on this in the, um, in the uh, uh, recent innovation section as well that I'll cover. Uh, but basically, uh, we have been working on a reporting API. And uh, we do plan to get this uh, released out in a controlled availability fashion uh, later in 2023. So our target right now is the 23C timeframe. So that's about August. And uh, we will obviously uh, stay tuned if you're interested in this because to the release briefings and the roadmap presentations, we will be talking about this more for sure. And uh, in essence, what this is, it's an API. Uh, it's OData based. So OData is a Microsoft uh, standard. <clears throat> Microsoft built, built up this standard. And that's an important for, uh, that's an important fact for I think one a particular usability case minimum uh, that I'll that I'll mention here in a sec, um, but in essence, it's a it's an OData connection API for Insight uh, to the data warehouse that powers Insight. Um, we're it, initially we'll, you'll be able to get the raw metrics out, so all of the all of the data that Insight has, um, including 
excuse me, um, all of the calculated metrics that Insight has that Eloqua actually doesn't have. So things like possible forward calculations um, and things of that nature, right, that you've never been able to get from Eloqua. You'll be able to get that from, uh, from this API as well. Uh, moving forward, we're also looking at, we're currently working on uh, proof of concept on uh, grabbing um, tabular reports. So if you build a custom report, for instance, within Insight or want to want to grab the data from a, uh, an out of the, one of the out of box uh, reports that we supply, um, we would love to be able to build endpoints that allow you to get that type of data as well. Um, so you can get, in essence, get a table. This would facilitate adding those reports to an internal website, to a, a you know intranet site um, where you could create your own dashboard um, and do a lot of other really, really nice things uh, with that data in an automated way. Um, to come back to the OData standard and Microsoft, um, if you look in Excel, you can actually open up Excel. You can connect it to an OData source and uh, pull data directly into Excel without having to write code. And so uh, this is another very exciting aspect um, from our view uh, in what we've talked with, uh, uh, how we've talked to customers about this on opening up capabilities for them to easily get this data and start manipulating it in tools that they're very familiar with as well. <clears throat> All right, we're also uh, been working on subject line optimization. <clears throat> so for those that have the AI add-on, we've been working with um, on the, the model that powers uh, subject line optimization just to get that updated, get it functioning better, um, get it uh, using better data sets as well, giving better predictions at the same time, um, and, and opening the door longer term uh, to start doing things potentially like getting, um, you know, providing recommendations uh, as opposed to only uh, ratings of subject lines as well. Um, so this is something, <coughs> excuse me, that we're looking at introducing uh, probably turning on some customers, reaching out to, to some of the customers that have uh, the AI on enabled already and uh, getting them going in um, um, on a CA program, you know, seeing if they seeing when they're ready to switch over um, probably in the first half of next year is what we're looking at at this stage. <clears throat> uh, we've also got several uh, Salesforce integration app enhancements that are on the slate for early next year. So we, we, you've probably uh, seen a couple of these roll out already, uh, but some of them are, we will be uh, moving these out again, still in our, our January, February apps releases and potentially even into March. Uh, and the list you see here is, these are all things that we've heard from customers um, that where they, they need these uh, capabilities, um, <clears throat> sometimes more frequently than others. Uh, but these are a lot. Of, this is a lot of things that the uh, that the native integration uh, would historically do. It's just not as not quite as commonly used. And uh, we've have we've uh, been working with customers over the last couple of years, particularly around Salesforce. We've noticed uh, and heard heard the the community speak up and done our own investigations as well. And uh, and we and we definitely want to deliver on this. There was a little bit of a lull in some of the Salesforce. Um, items that we were delivering over the last, I think, few releases, uh, but we have a window of opportunity now and we are, uh, we're seizing that to be able to, to, uh, to, to put some more attention onto the Salesforce integration um, as we move forward here as well. All right, uh, a couple more slides here and then we'll switch over to the next section. Um, another place where we've gotten a lot of customer feedback around API endpoint support. Uh, so this is another place where uh, we want to be able to um, introduce support for uh, some endpoints that we actually have in the product that we just don't have them documented. And so uh, things like creating security groups and campaign fields, uh, field merges, folders, dynamic content, et cetera. <clears throat> we, you will be seeing these come out in the release notes where we're actually currently working on these. So this will be the first half of 2023 where these start to show up. And again, we're always trying to take a look and, and get feedback from our customer base on what endpoints, what do they want to do in automated ways via our, our APIs. Um, and we want to respond to those. We want to respond to those requests and be able to, to get these, um, these different endpoints supported um, and out there so you can do more with the application, again, with less effort. Um, these come in handy. <clears throat> Very specifically, we had, we had a few customers come to us and say, listen, we have multiple instances when we stand a new one up. We want to be able to create the security groups and the, the fields across all objects, not just contacts and accounts, but campaigns too. Um, the field merges, the foldering structures as well. <coughs> we want to be able to create all of those um, so they're consistent with the other instances that we have. So when a global admin logs in, they can see the same structure and, and have familiarity 
and they can build automation processes then if they're building all of these fields and all of these assets um, in a, a programmatic way they can then access those in a programmatic way and have predictability uh, fewer errors as well so really excited to be able to get to get some of this capability out as well um, we introduced um, a major new feature a year ago um, probably about 53 weeks ago at this point, uh, based on the release schedule from last year, um, where uh, we introduced SMS as a native channel. And we've had great success, great interest with that um, offering as well over the last 12 months or so. And um, we're continuing to invest in that as well. You, I think you've seen probably in every release briefing that there's some attention on SMS, there's new features being released and that won't change. <clears throat> we are uh, planning to build in segmentation for SMS um, activities, um, SMS, you know, different related SMS items. Um, so phone number consent will be the first one. You'll see that come in 23A. 23A. I believe replied to is also in the 23A plan. Uh, and then as we get into 23B and 23C and further, you'll start to see additional uh, filters show up uh, within segments that are related to SMS as well. Uh, so really happy to be able to get this out as well. This will help not just with creating audiences, but with decisioning on canvases as well. Uh, and then we're also looking at um, some improvements uh, around the canvas. So um, introducing sending options such as throttling uh, very directly on the on the send step, um, sending to unsubscribe members. There, they, there have been some use cases. There's, there's obviously high sensitivity to sending to numbers that have been unsubscribed, uh, but there are use cases that do come up where you still want to do that. And it's, it's legally from a, from a compliance and a privacy point of view, it is actually okay to do that. Um, for certain types of communications. So we're looking at opening this up. And then lastly, um, we're, uh, we're looking at um, having the SMS step operate at the same speed as all of the other steps, right? Currently, the sending of messages is very quick, but the feedback we get from the aggregators before we can confirm that a message has been sent um, and you know, get, get that confirmation back uh, is a little bit slow compared to how we do uh, other types of sends because we own the entire process for say an email send. For SMS, we don't, we have to hand off. And, uh, and so we're looking at speeding this up and ways to speed this up to get it at the same level of performance. Uh, we're looking at around the 23B timeframe currently. Um, there, there's emails flying around even just last week and this week on this topic internally. Uh, so it is something that we're actively uh, engaged in and actually building out. So it'll be, um, so look for that probably in the you know, late first half of uh, 2023. And, um, and we're, again, we're very excited to get this piece out as well. Okay, I'm gonna <clears throat> switch over. I, we've got about 15 minutes here. And I know Karen, you wanted a, a couple minutes at the end here. So I'll, I'll try to get through these kind of quick. Um, <clears throat> recent innovations, we, we introduced automated uh, certificate management. Um, this is in controlled availability, uh, but in essence, what this does is it, is it takes the uh, the uh, SKU that we had around purchasing a secure microsite and it obsoletes it, and it makes it free for every customer to have a secure microsite. Um, <clears throat> we built in uh, capabilities within our platform uh, to uh, to grant those certificates and to update those certificates for you, uh, so you don't even have to worry about any of that. You just come in, uh, create your secure microsite, turn it on for automated certificate management, uh, and then um, and obviously take your domain and, and plug it in, and, you, and then you've got a secure microsite. Again, making this as easy as possible, quick as possible for you to get up and running in a modern, secure fashion that's expected on the internet today. Um, <clears throat> the if This is in CA um, because if you have existing microsites that aren't secured, uh, depending on the configuration of the domains for those microsites, you may need to make some updates. You need, may need to make some changes. Um, for if you if you're a new customer and you've if you've created those domains in the in the in a, you know within the last few years, you're probably perfectly fine. Probably don't need to change anything. Um, I have a, an instance of Eloqua that I uh, stood up about in 2010, and back then we created the domain records and configured them a little bit differently than we do today. And I actually had to go in and change some settings on my domains to actually enable this, but it it wasn't that difficult, right? It, it was a, a couple minute type of thing, go in and clean up a couple dependencies in Eloqua if I needed to, if I wanted to remove things and then and then I was able to uh, to turn this on. And I haven't, I've got secure microsites in my instance for free. I haven't, I just haven't paid a penny for it, which is, which is fantastic. So highly recommend you take a look at this if you haven't already. <clears throat> 
uh, multi-branded domains, we've introduced this uh, capability as well recently. Uh, we can configure up to 10 brands with this, within a single instance. Um, you can select which brand to actually use when you're creating emails. Um, this will control the application and image domains. They will be the, that brand will be automatically applied to the email and to those um, links that are in the email as well. Um, and again, just allows you to easily create and manage the campaigns for these uh, for across multiple brands within a single instance of Eloqua. Um, it does require uh, premium branding and configuration. Uh, so uh, if this is something of interest to you, if you are managing multiple brands, please, by all means, reach out and, and uh, we'll, we can figure out how to get you going. Um, <clears throat> on the reporting API topic, um, I did want to mention recently the Oracle Fusion Analytics Warehouse team. Uh, they introduced an integration to Eloqua. And uh, in essence, they are using that report, that same reporting API that we talked about. Um, they, they have access to it um, already. So they're kind of our first customer, uh, so to speak. And what Fusion Analytics Warehouse is, it's, a, it's an analytics warehouse that allows you to build reports and so forth. Um, you know, panels, uh, you see some of the panels of the reports and summaries that you, on the screen here in the screenshots. And uh, this is just taking Eloqua data plus data from any other connector that they might have. So for instance, to CX sales or to Salesforce and <clears throat> to other applications, it's pulling all of this data into a central repository. Um, and then you can, and then you as a marketer can build, um, or obviously business owner can build uh, the reports across application, across that, that larger data set. Uh, what we're looking at doing in the future as well, um, just a, kind of a little bit of a future facing item here, as we build out that reporting API, we're also looking at getting uh, revenue attribution, so closed loop reporting type of um, the, the, the components that make up closed loop reporting in Eloqua. All of that data set we're looking at exposing via this uh, reporting OData API um, and connecting Fusion Analytics Warehouse to that as well. So you can then build your, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you can then build your um, your revenue attribution reports and your your closed loop reports within Fusion Analytics Warehouse as well and probably open up a whole new world of, of being able to report on that ROI on your campaigns across multiple um, you know, job functional areas and, and data sets as well. So some pretty exciting stuff um, to think about here uh, coming in, in the future. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, we introduced engaged send limits. Um, this was a little bit earlier this year, again, based on uh, popular feedback that we got from customers using Engage. Um, they wanted to be able to control how many emails a sales rep could send so they weren't saturating and kind of overwhelming, uh, the sales reps weren't overwhelming um, via Engage some of their uh, prospects and customers and so forth. Um, so you can set limits um, to the number of emails that are sent, um, say, uh, over a certain number of period of days um, via some easy configuration. Uh, and this does apply to both Engage and um, Outlook. So it's it's not just Engage, uh, for instance, in this case. We introduced a few new uh, dashboards, uh, updated dashboards and reports with an insight. So there's a, a database uh, growth trend report that's been introduced. Uh, so this will just show you how your database is changing uh, over time. Again, highly, highly popular. And, and this is something that's uh, presented to customers by Oracle uh, you know, in, in certain cases as well on a, on a regular basis. So we're happy to get that into the product. Um, an updated contact field analysis. There, there's always been a field analysis uh, report, a contact health uh, type of dashboard, but we're, we're updating these things to just modernize them and again, make them easier to consume, um, um, faster to consume as well. Um, we probably a lot of talk about this one in the past um, in, uh, in the form of uh, not necessarily the report that we're showing here, but in the sense of um, Apple out announced a year ago, they announced they were um, introducing this auto open capability where um, if a marketing email comes in from certain parties, they're going to grab all of the images, <clears throat> they're going to uh, potentially follow all of the links that were in that email, and they're going to cache all the information. So if you then open that, as a user opens that email, it won't actually go out uh, to those servers and, and have to download the images at open time. Further, they would be uh, not just uh, grabbing the images, um, but they would be in essence anonymizing themselves. So it in essence kind of removed the applicability of the opens uh, sent to those particular email, uh, the Apple's email client. Um, <clears throat> We've uh, introduced the ability to identify those opens as well as those clicks. And it turns out that Apple's not the only one doing this. There's other services that are doing similar things as well. 
And um, as we introduced the ability to identify those, we then realized we need to be able to report on how many, op how many auto opens are happening versus how many um, actual real opens are happening. And so we've introduced that capability within this uh, auto, and out uh, auto activity analysis report as well. Um, you can see in the table there, it might be a little bit hard to read, it's hard to see, but you see auto open, uh, there's unique opens and there's total opens as well. So this gives you a view of how many auto opens, automatic you know, robot type opens are happening, how many auto clicks are happening compared to real unique clicks and, and total clicks as well. And so again, some information just to help uh, make sense of all the data set, the changing data set that's coming in uh, so you can get a better view of your, of your effectiveness. <clears throat> All right, and then this is the last slide I have. Um, the, we, I like to highlight this. This is a seemingly very small thing, but it's also been something that's um, very bothersome and troublesome when it actually happens. And, and really happy to announce that we finally fixed this just recently. Um, the story is, you know, uh, back in, I think it was 2011 when we introduced campaign um, integration <clears throat> within our native integrations. Um, when you would save a campaign in Eloqua, that would trigger a synchronization to the CRM system to create a campaign there. And we would rely on the feedback from the CRM system to populate this CRM campaign ID value that you see down here. Uh, there, I'm sure there's people on this call that are familiar with this. Um, if the user kept the campaign open and kept modifying that campaign and hitting save, when the feedback came from the CRM system to populate this value, it would update the database, but it would not update the UI. So if the user continued to save, the UI has the blank value, it would actually empty and nullify the value that got that came back from the CRM integration. Um, and this caused problems, right? Um, you had to either manually populate the field value back if you wanted it, or you just had to close the campaign, reopen it at some time later to see if the value was there. Um, and then you can start editing again. It was, it was a headache. It sucked. Um, we, when we updated to our, um, our CRM apps, this uh, became a, a you know, five to 15 minute kind of time frame down to a five to, ten, five to 15 second time frame for the campaign ID to came back, come back. So it, it actually reduced the, the wait, right? So you could, in essence, you could save the campaign, you could close it, you could open it back up and the campaign ID would be there, but you'd have to remember to do that and not everybody remembers to do that every time. So it could still cause a problem. And so uh, what we've done with this update is we've um, made the UI aware and made it check when you save a campaign, checks to see, is there a value for this CRM campaign ID in the database? And if there is, and it's blank in the UI, the UI just updates itself with the campaign ID. It doesn't blank it out in the database anymore. Uh, and so this is uh, this helps address the situations where your the, the marketer just isn't aware, doesn't need to be aware that that they have got a blank value in their UI and need to be aware of the processes happening behind the scenes. <clears throat> they don't lose this value, and that saves a bunch of time in the future when campaign responses start to come in and campaign members need to be created, and this this value actually needs to be populated. All right, I'll, I'll stop there, but again, very, really happy uh, that we're able to introduce that feature. Finally, I, it's long overdue, I, in my opinion, probably about 10 years overdue. Um, and uh, we're gonna record this as a group internally on Monday of next week. So this slide deck and a lot of the information that you see here will be available on top liners. Uh, so I won't spend a bunch of time on the additional resources here, but, but look on Monday on top liners, you should see the, the recording posted there as well. I'll pause there. I think I'm a little bit over time giving you a, a little bit of a crunch, um, Karen, but uh, yeah. that's my show. And thanks, thanks again for the time. Well, absolutely. Thank you, Chris, for doing this. Couple questions for you. And I don't think we're gonna have time for the poll, which is okay, guys. I'll send you a, a survey monkey actually with the poll questions and share the uh, the answers with everybody as well. Um, so with that last feature change with the campaign ID, how long has that been, or how long has it been live? I think is the question. I think it was introduced in 23C, uh, 22C. Um, well, I'll have to double check, but I, I think it was 23C. Okay, thank you. It's, it's then, still pretty new. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, the next one, are auto opens included in total opens or unique opens? Uh, I believe they're in, uh, you know what? Let me double check that. 
um, we, when we collect the auto opens, in essence, we quarantine them. And so my, what I want to say is I, I don't think they're included in either. I think there are, there are their own category completely, but they might be included in total. It just depends on how the report builds. But let me, let me verify on that one. That's a great question. Okay. That sounds good. And I will say guys, like other marketing automation platforms and even just like email sending platforms um, don't have auto clicks and auto opens trackable and shown like for segmentation or reporting like Eloqua does. So thankfully Chris and team at the Oracle product management group are ahead of the game. Um, I just dropped a link in the, in the chat too. Uh, we actually have an excellent explainer on auto opens and auto clicks that Otilia pulled together. So check that link out in top liners. Hopefully that'll help you answer most of those questions. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks Jody. Jody. Yeah, my pleasure. And then the last question is, um, how is Oracle supporting the cookie list future? If you want. Yeah, so, um, so I would say, so I think, you know, my response to this is I think a cookie list future is actually, I think further away than, than we might think. Third party cookies, um, don't use them. Like they're, the, the end is nigh, right? <laughs> um, they, so I third-party cookies, we're supporting that in the sense that of using first-party cookies in Eloqua, right? Um, that's been the capability for quite a long time. It's what we would recommend everybody do. Uh, but there's <clears throat> getting rid of first-party cookies means a lot of things on the internet don't operate the way that they do today that we actually like. Not, not we as Oracle, but we as people using the internet. Things like remembering... The fact that you're logged into Amazon um, and you don't have to log in every single time, yeah. that's that's a first party cookie, believe it or not. Um, and, uh, and so if we get rid of if we get rid of all of the cookies, we lose a lot of really nice convenience features as well. Um, but we uh, we're, we're definitely staying close and keeping our eye on the technology changes. Um, we've been paying attention to the third party cookies. We've, we've been paying attention to the fact that Chrome Obviously, just a couple months ago, maybe it was more than a couple months ago now, they, they, they said, hey, we haven't figured out the third-party cookie mess yet either, even yeah. though we thought we would. So we're extending our support in Chrome for a whole nother like 12 to 18 months further out than they thought they would as well. And we're, we're keeping, we're definitely staying close to a lot of that, those changes as well and adopting as we need to. Okay. That's right on par too, guys. That's what we're hearing here at Sojourn too with various platforms. First party cookies aren't going away anytime soon. Like I wouldn't think at least five years, if they ever even do, I actually highly doubt first party cookies will completely go away. Third party, for the most part, they're not leveraged as much. Like when we have somebody brand new to Eloqua or Marketo or whatever, we recommend they do not um, implement third party cookies. They implement first party cookies. If they push, we'll do both, but definitely first party cookies are the priority. So um, we're out of time. I wanna be respectful of that for everybody. So thank you for joining, Chris. Thank you so much for presenting. Jody for helping answer questions. Kristen Connell for helping to answer questions that came to the Q&A. Our next Outlook user group will be the third Thursday in January. I believe it's the 19th. So we'll send you out the invite and uh, follow us on LinkedIn. And we always promote it there and remind people of the user groups there as well, if you'd like. So thank you guys so much for attending. Happy holidays. Hope you guys enjoy it. Um, get some time off and uh, stay safe. Bye, everybody. Thanks a lot, KP. You're welcome. Bye, Chris. Thank you. Bye-bye.